Well, good morning, City Church. I am not here to worship with you this morning, but I am excited to announce the man that will be bringing this morning's sermon. His name is Pete Bulat. Pete and his wife Amy first came through Charlottesville in the year 2000 to meet with me and to share the burden they had to pioneer Chi Alpha Campus Ministry on grounds at UVA. Since that time, God has blessed their ministry abundantly to where on Monday nights at m &L, as well as in their core groups, they have hundreds and hundreds of students every week that are involved with Chi Alpha Campus Ministry. So I'm so excited that Pete was available while I was going to be away. So would you now please give a warm City Church welcome to Pete Bulette. Gracious and glorious God, more glorious than the most glorious thought we've ever thought of you, better than the best thought, higher than the highest thought, we pause and we humbly open our hearts to your word, and we ask that the truth of your word would become the truth of our lives and would saturate to the core of our being that we would look more like Jesus and love him more for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, it is my joy to bring the message this morning, and I hope Pastor Pete is having a great day wherever he is. He had a well-deserved break, that is for sure. Uh, we are in a series on change, and... Um, the topic was given to me on change, which is fairly broad, and as I was thinking about what to share, I was thinking about uh, what is one of the things that is um, most consequential in the human experience, in the human existence, and I came to this topic that uh, I want to share on uh, this morning. In fact, it's, it's a topic that I have seen impact my life in surprising ways, yet it's a it's a topic that we don't often talk about in the Western world. We kind of underestimate its impact because, and frankly, it does a lot of its work in the dark. It goes without being named. It goes without being seen. In fact, that is actually its tactic because it, if you name it, then you know how to deal with it. But if you don't know what you're dealing with, then it can continue to do its work without you ever even knowing it. So what is the topic? The topic is the topic of shame. I would like to start by giving you a definition of, of shame as we kind of come out of the gate. Uh, here's the definition of, of what I'm talking about. Same, shame is this sense of not being enough, a sense of deficiency or inferiority or inadequacy, um, insufficiency or unworthiness. It's this idea that you're somehow flawed and that you're unworthy of acceptance. Shame. It's interesting, when you open up the Bible, and, and the first book of the Bible is Genesis, that as we learn about the impact of the fall on humanity, the thing that is highlighted the most is this reality called shame. In fact, it, it ends right before the, the, the fall happens and the temptation of the fall. It ends by saying that the man and woman, that they were both uh, in, in the garden and that they were naked and they felt no Shame. What he's wanting you to see is the existence of humanity before the fall was this pre-shame experience, that there was no sense of insufficiency, no sense of, of being flawed and, and unworthy and, and uh, inadequate or, or deficient in some way. They were totally vulnerable, yet they didn't experience shame in that vulnerability. And then when we see the fall happens, the next thing that we, that, that we see is, is what, what does humanity do right after the fall? They go and they hide. They hide from God and they sew fig leaves together. What, what is this? This is a picture of what it looks like when shame comes. And to the human experience, that all of a sudden we are hiding, we're covering ourselves with fig leaves. And, and, and here's the thing, what shame does is it pulls us away from God and it isolates us from each other. And that's exactly what we see happening in the garden. This movement away from God and movement away from each other. Uh, 
a Christian uh, psychiatrist by the name of uh, Kirk Thompson wrote a book called The Soul of Shame, and here's a quote from his book. It says this, is, to be human is to be infected with this phenomenon we call shame. In fact, let's do a little exercise so you can kind of get in touch with where shame may have uh, come up in your life. Um, let's talk about uh, those wonderful years of middle school. <laughs> Yes, dare we, dare we go back there. Uh, middle school, even high school for some of you. Um, I, here, here's a question I would have. When you went into middle school, when you went into high school, how would you fill in this blank? In, in middle school, I was not blank enough. And yeah, I was not blank enough. Well, how did you fill in that blank when you were in middle school or high school? I mean, it, it, it could have a hundred different answers of what could be in that blank. It could be that you were not smart enough or you weren't pretty enough, or you weren't tall enough, or athletic enough, or cool enough, or skinny enough, or beautiful enough, or popular enough, or developed enough, or strong enough, or important enough, or, or wealthy enough, or funny enough, or you, you could keep going on. In fact, some of you, as, as, I, as you think about how you would fill in that blank, you can almost hear a voice saying it to you. It's a parent that you can never quite Make happy. Or, or the voice of a coach or a peer that, that, that always kind of kept you at arm's length that you, you desperately wanted, but they never let you in. And then what happens is we grow and we enter into adulthood and then it just changes slightly. You can go ahead and put up the next slide. It just changes to this, that I am not blank enough. I mean, you're so familiar with your own fallenness. I mean, who's more familiar with your fallenness and weaknesses than you are? And then you, you, you're either at UVA or Charlottesville where it looks like everybody's got it all together. And if you ever question if they have it all together, all you have to do is get on social media and find out they got it all together. I mean, look at their perfectly curated lives. I mean, look at that. They, they do have it all together, and it just reinforces. You log off, and, and it, you just are reinforced with the sense of, yes, I am not a, enough. A deficiency, an inferiority, a insufficiency. And if we don't bring this into the light of the gospel, into the light of the truth of what Jesus brings into our hearts, we will live all of our lives trying to somehow cover our sense of shame. And I wonder how many gyms are full of people trying to put on a little bit more muscle to cover their shame. Let me talk, talk about how this plays out. Uh, let's talk about how it plays out in your work. Um, I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass you, but are there any perfectionists out there? I'm a recovering perfectionist. I'll raise my hand, okay? But I'm getting ready to share how perfectionism works. I'm a perfectionist, and, and I, I remember uh, hearing this quote. I think it was by Brene Brown, but somebody else shared it with me, and it, it was this, that when perfectionism is at the wheel, shame is in the passenger seat, and anxiety and worry is in the back seat. And when I heard that, I was like, there's my life. Well, why? Because th this, this shame that you, your perfectionism is desperately trying to show that you are enough, that you are sufficient, that you aren't somehow deeply flawed, that you will be enough. And so you work yourself to the bone and you're not willing to settle for anything less than perfection, lest your suspicion about yourself come to the surface and everybody else find out that you are not enough. I read an article in the Harvard Business Review. It was sent to me by one of our students I was talking to about this. And, and the, the title of the article was this, If you're so successful, then why do you still work 70 hours a week? And this uh, author by the name of Laura Epsom, she, she looked at what was driving this workaholism that, it, that defines much of the white-collar world, and all these people are so successful. So she, uh, she interviewed over 500 people, and as she interviewed them, uh, she said the, the answer became extremely clear that, and this is what she said, and I quote, at the heart of it is insecurity. 
In fact, she went on in the article to talk about how many professional, elite professional organizations have trained their recruiters to look for what they call insecure overachievers because they know this, that if they will recruit an insecure overachiever, that person will give 120% because they're trying to make sure that their shame doesn't surface and that they're not shown to somehow be inadequate. And so it's exploited by the business world so they can use it for the good of their company. Shame. What, is it, what does shame look like in friendships? It looks like this. It's this sense that you have inside of you that somehow your friendship with them means more to you than their fr- friendship with you could ever mean to them. That somehow you're not enough for them and that you're just fortunate that they're willing to be your friend. Anybody ever felt that way? I have. What does it look like in parenting? It looks like this. We're so scared that we're going to be insufficient that we will go to the nth degree to curate our kids' lives to show that, see, our kids turned out okay. I wasn't insufficient after all. Or we'll go the other way and we'll just become angry parents who fly off the handle because every time our kids act out, we can't handle the shame that it brings on us that's confirming that indeed we are inferior and and somehow not enough. And so we sign up our kid for for another language they can learn. And what does it look like in our walk with God? It looks like we feel like we've got to give 110% because we know that at the end of the day, God just barely tolerates us and he is fundamentally disappointed with us. And so we crawl into his presence with shame. Well, that brings us to our text for today. We're going to look at Moses' life. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to see, we're going to pick up his story. His story is a very checkered story early on, the first 80 years of his life. And and we're going to pick it up. He's just had an encounter at the burning bush with, um, with the... Uh, with, with the living God. And the living God has given him a, a, a vision for his life and says, I want to use you to deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of their slavery. I want to use you to be the man, you to be the deliverer. And Moses is like, uh, you got the wrong guy. Sorry. And so uh, one would think that perhaps he would skip from Mount Horeb all the way back to Egypt and be like, "Woo! you never believe what God called me to do. I'm going to deliver you. You No, 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 that's not, that, that is not at all what he does. He starts arguing with God because he is so racked in shame that he has all, he, he gives him five different reasons why he's got the wrong guy. And shame is about ready to keep him from God's plans and purposes for his life. And so that's where we're going to pick up. We are in chapter 3, we're going to be in verse 11. It says this, but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Okay, so, so here's the first thing that we get that, that uh, Moses says, Are you kidding me? I am not qualified enough. I'm totally not qualified enough. In fact, you go for the, in fact uh, if the job was posted for deliver of the Israelites out of Egypt on you know Monster.com, what, 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 LinkedIn, you know, if that if that job was was posted, I wouldn't even submit my resume. Do you know my resume, God? Like, here's Moses' story. Moses was raised in the house of Egypt as a, really to be a prince. In Pharaoh's house, which is a long story, has how an Israelite ended up there, but he ended up there. Well, one day he goes out and he sees a man, who, an Egyptian man, beating an Israelite. He takes things into his own hands in his angry, anger and fury. He kills the man, tries to cover it up. The word comes out, Moses killed this man. And so Moses has to flee from the, the palace and go into Midian. And so what does he do in Midian? He finds a wife. As he finds his wife, a wife, he also gets a job because his father-in-law was a shepherd, and so now he becomes a shepherd under his father-in-law. Now, here's what you need to know. In that day, the Bible tells us in Genesis that, that shepherds were detestable to Egyptians. And so here's a man who takes on a career that was, he was raised to detest. 
And not only that, he wasn't even a good shepherd. Why do we know that? Because he's watching his father-in-law's sheep. 40 years later, he's still watching his father-in-law's sheep. He's not like exactly tearing up the shepherding world. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) And you got to wonder how he would think about, man, what? That one moment of rage cost me everything. Now I have a detestable job and I'm not even doing it very well. And he's like, I'm not qualified enough. And so what does God do? Verse 12, and God said, I will be with you. In fact, so what God doesn't do is this. He just said, but Moses, you need to understand, you are the right per- You are so qualified. You were raised in Pharaoh's household. I mean, who better to walk the, 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 the halls of Pharaoh's household than you? And then you, you got your PhD in the wilderness. You've been there for 40 years, bro. Like, you're the man. You can, that's where we're going. No, he, God, God doesn't do that. He doesn't try to give him a lot of self-help, and, but you are so good. No, just say it. Say it again. Say it again. I'm good. No, no. <laughs> what does he do? He says, but I will be with you. He points to who he is with God. Well, Moses continues on. Verse 13, then Moses said to God, okay, suppose I go to the Israelites. Just let's suppose. I go, and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, and they then ask me, well, what is his name? Then what will I tell them? Like, okay, so this is Moses saying, I'm not knowledgeable enough, right? Okay, so so Moses is like, okay, God, let's just suppose I go, and and they say, what is your name? And I'm like, I got nothing. (laughs) Like, you stumped me right there. Like, what am I even going to say? I don't even know your name. And uh, this is how God replies. He says, I am who I am. That is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. It's interesting. I am. What, What kind of name is I am? I am is a name that declares the supremacy and the centrality of God in the entire universe. It's the most self-sufficient name one could ever have. In fact, this I am is the the name that becomes Yahweh, the name of of the God uh, of of the covenant people of Israel. And then we translated it uh, Jehovah, and then we translate it into your English text that, uh, that is Lord. If you ever see Lord in all caps, that is the name of, of, of I am. Okay, so if you ever see all caps in, in, the, in the translation, that is the I am covenant name of God. And I remember Dick Foth, uh, my friend, one time giving a message on this, and he said this. He said, the name I am is the most secure name in the universe. And here's Moses in his shame, finds out that he's talking to and in covenant with this most secure name of the universe. And God's saying, if you're with me, then you're secure. If you're with me, then you're qualified. Well, Moses is uh, stubborn, and so he, he keeps going. And hop over to chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered, but what if they don't believe me or listen? And so, so Moses says, but what if I'm not convincing enough? And, and, and here's what God says. He, God says, what's in your hand, Moses? He's like, uh, my shepherd's staff. And, and, and God says, throw it down. And so he throws down the staff. And by the way, isn't it interesting that God goes for his staff? See, what you need to understand is in that day, the staff was actually, it was like the, uh, the passport of your day. It was like your student ID. It was, it, it was a symbol of your identity, one staff. It's like, are you really Moses? Okay, you're Moses, right? Like, it's my staff. He says, throw it down. And then he says, and it throws it down, and it turns into a snake. And Moses backs up, and then he reaches down, and he picks it back up. It turns back into a staff. And what was God doing? God was saying, if you go, my power will be with you. Then he does a couple other signs I don't have time to get into right now. But there are other signs. And so in the midst of these miraculous, supernatural signs, Moses is like, but I have another objection. <laughs> Verse 10. Pardon your servant, Lord, but I have never been eloquent neither in the past or since 
Uh, you have spoken to your servant. I, I'm slow of speech and tongue. And we don't know what was going on with Moses. We don't know if he had a speech impediment. We don't know if he, he uh, never mastered Egyptian. I, we, we're not sure. We don't know if he doesn't believe in his own diplomatic skills. But we know this. He's like, I am not eloquent enough. And God says, oh, uh, Moses, who made your mouth? He's like, good point. Uh, and then finally, Moses keeps going. Verse 13, but Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please just send someone else. I'm not enough. You don't understand. And then Moses, okay, so let's, let's get this picture. Moses has had promised that God would be with him. God keeps pointing, but, I, but it's not about you, it's about me. And Moses is like, but you don't understand me. I'm, I'm way insufficient. I'm not enough. I, I'm, I'm deficient in ways that I'm painful. No, 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 but it's not about you. It's about me and who you are with me. And it's like even the miraculous signs cannot break through the shame that's taken hold of, of Moses' life. A friend of mine says that shame, Michael John Cusick, says that shame is like a raincoat that wraps around our soul. And it keeps us from being able to absorb the living water that wants to make us the beloved in Christ. And as you read this text, you can sense the raincoat around Moses' soul. Truth after truth and miracle after miracle. And it's just like it's just deflected off. It, it, it's like, okay, yeah, 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 that's good for other people. That's not me. Like, you don't understand. The shame has so wrapped itself around Moses' soul, and it won't let go. And so the truth, it just deflects off. It doesn't sink in. It doesn't go into his being. It doesn't transform his life. It just kind of deflects off. And what is he left with? He's left with his shame when God is trying to pour out the living water that he would be saturated in the truth and love of God. But the raincoat of shame. So what do we do in our shame? Here's what we often do in our shame. <clears throat> we do one of two things. We either puff ourselves up and try to make ourselves bigger than we are. And that's when we, you know, double down at, 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 at work and become perfectionists at work or we double down in the gym or we, or we double down in our parenting because we're trying to make ourselves bigger than we are and, and in fact we actually get angry in those moments too because we're trying to ignore the, the sense of shame and say there isn't something wrong with me, there's something wrong with you and so we can puff up and we can then explode over here. Or we can do the exact opposite. And this is what we see happening with, with Moses is that we actually shrink back and say there's something wrong with me and we try to hide and we isolate ourselves and say, no, 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 you, you got the wrong person. And so we either puff up or shrink back. But here's what God's trying to do. God's trying to get Moses just to stand his sacred ground of who God made Moses to be. And another Brene Brown quote, she says this, don't shrink back, don't puff up, just stand your sacred ground. Can you guys say that with me? Can we do that? I don't normally do that, can you, but can we do that? Let's say it together. Don't shrink back, don't puff up, just stand your sacred ground. And that is what God is wanting Moses to do. Just stand the ground that I have for you, Moses. But instead, shame has wrapped itself around his soul. And he, this idea that he's not enough, this idea that he is insufficient, just keeps grabbing a hold of him and won't let go. Well, in verse 14 of chapter 4, Moses finally agrees to go. Why? Because God says he'll send Aaron with him, which, by the way, the two ways we overcome shame is by the truth of God and connection with others. And finally, he agrees to go. And, and God tells Moses, hey, take your staff with you. And he takes the staff with him, and a few 
verses later and verse 20 that same staff now goes from Moses to staff and now it's called the staff of God isn't it interesting the symbol of his shame that i wonder how many times he just wanted to break that staff over his knee when he realized how what is that should have been a scepter a prince's scepter for the superpower of the world in his hands instead he has this lowly shepherd staff but now god takes the symbol of his shame and turns it into a symbol of honor it will be that staff that he will hold over the waters and the waters will part It is that staff that will lead the people of Israel across the Red Sea. It is the staff of God now. The Old Testament scholar said this. Go ahead and put it up. God will use the symbol of loneliness and unimportance to bring about the central salvific act of the entire Old Testament. Here's what we see God is fighting for for Moses' soul. He's trying to deliver the deliverer. He's saying, Moses, don't just live there in your shame. I have something for you. I have more to stand your sacred ground. I'm not content watching shame win. Come over here and step into the honor I have for you. And God is relentless over your life, and over my life. That shame wouldn't win. A couple thousand years later, a man will be born. who will start to walk the streets of Galilee and say, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the living water. And one day, he will stand before the authorities of his day. And they'll ask him a question, Are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed one? And he will look them into their eyes and he will give this response. I am. And as a result, he will be led away. And they will strip him naked. And they will hang him on a cross to crucify him. Because here's the thing. Crucifixion was the most shame-filled thing that could ever happen to someone. They will shame him and put him as close to the town square as they can so everybody can see his shame. And why? Why? Why would he do such a thing? Why did he do such a thing? Why would Jesus go to the cross? He would do it for this reason. To bear our shame. And then he would be buried. And then he would rise again in victory and in honor. Why? So that you could live in the honor of being a child of God. So you could be brought out of your shame. And stand in the honor that God has for you. Who he created you to be. And then Jesus. I don't know where the worship people are, but you guys can come. (laughs) And then Jesus says this. He says, sorry, I didn't give him the cue. He says, well, Paul says this. Paul says, in Christ You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. What does that mean? Well, he changes the equation. Let me show you what the new equation is. In in the I am, I am eternally loved. In the I am, I'm totally forgiven. In the I am, I'm extremely valued. In the I am, I'm fully capable for what God has for me. In the I am, I am welcomed. In the I am, I am enough. 
And he changes the equation of our lives. But here's the facts. Oftentimes, we still wrestle with the raincoat. It's interesting. If you keep reading the story in chapter 6, things aren't going to go as Moses had planned. And what do you see? Moses putting the raincoat back. Oh, well, I, I told you guys I didn't talk very well. And I think you know, it's probably all my fault. And shame comes upon him again. And Jesus it c- comes to us. And he's like, no, I want you to take the raincoat off. And I want to saturate you in the truth of who you are. Who, can you put that back up? Who you are in the I am. I want to saturate you in these truths until the raincoat is removed. And the core of your being is saturated in this. And, and to, on Tuesday and on Wednesday, when you go to work and when you go to the gym and when you go to class, this is what defines you. But here's the problem, and I'm so familiar with this. I can put on the raincoat again so quickly. Maybe you don't. But I wake up on a Tuesday and wrap myself. See, here's what I know. My own fallen nature, living in a fallen culture, Around fallen people, shame can just come back on me. And now I'm living more like Moses than like a child of God. I would like for you to stand. God tells Moses, take your staff, take that symbol of your shame, and go deliver my people in honor, in honor. As they begin to play, I want you to picture something. I want you to picture Jesus coming up to you. Go ahead and close your eyes for a moment. I want you to picture Jesus coming up to you. And he comes up and he unzips your raincoat of shame. He says, I want that. And part of you is like, uh, I've gotten so used to this raincoat that you desperately want to get rid of it, but you don't know how to live without it. And then he starts to take it off of you. He said, this is why I went to the cross. You don't have to live that way. There's a whole new way of living. There's a whole new currency of your life. There's a whole new fuel for your life. There's a whole new way to live. And he takes the raincoat and he casts it aside. And then he comes and he brings a robe. It's a robe of honor. And he puts it over your shoulders. He says, now I want you to live in this. I want you to live in the robe of honor that you are enough, that you are welcomed, that you are a child of God. You don't have to go out there and live for acceptance. You can live from acceptance with this robe. You don't have to go out there and live for love. You can live from love with this robe. He said, that is what I die. Heavenly Father, as we respond, I ask that raincoats would be taken off, thrown away, destroyed, and that robes of honor, like you put on the prodigal son, would be worn, that freedom would take hold and that your plans and purposes will prevail for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name.